Hello, everybody. My name is Leif Andresen, and uh, I'm representing the uh, the BIPFAM in Europe workshop uh, organizing group to uh, have organized this event, and we will start in a minute or two. Yes. Um, hello again. I will I will take the screen. So, and I say it's organized by the organizer group of Big Trip Workshop in Europe. And uh, I'm happy to introduce this. And uh, first, like I say, I have been a member of the work, uh, organizer group for uh, the BPRIM workshop in Europe for, in the last five years and have the pleasure to say hello or goodbye to these events. I have also been active with uh, Dublin Core for many years. And I stopped to be the liaison between uh, ISO TC46 and uh, DCMI uh, this, uh, this spring. But welcome to this event about a BIP frame. Uh, first, what is BIP frame? Uh, it's uh, the Bibliographic Framework Initiative is initiated by the Library of Congress. And the BIP frame provides a foundation for the future of the bibliographic description, both on the web and in the broader network world that is grounded in linked data techniques. And uh, a major focus of the initiative is to determine a transition path for the Mark 21 formats while preserving a robust data exchange that has supported resource share and catalog cost saving in recent decades. And the Big Frame Workshop Week in Europe is a forum for sharing knowledge about practice, production, with and planning of Big Frame implementations. Uh, it's a series of annual workshops that is an organizer group. And we have now five sites with the presentations. And we have a mailing list. And uh, one of the things we have also a dialogue with the RDA's uh, steering group about relation between uh, RDA and BIP frame. The today's panel gives uh, the status of implementation of BIP frame at the Library of Congress, uh, the National Library of Sweden, and uh, the National Library of Hungary. And there are also presentations of uh, two incorporation projects, uh, the Linked Data for Production project and the uh, Shared Virtual Discovery Environment project. And the panelists uh, is Sally McCollum from the Library of Congress, Philip Scheuer from Stanford University, and Friedrich Klingwald from the National Library of Sweden, and Titiana Pusumato from Casalini Libri and Colt, and Miklos Lindway from uh, the National Library of Hungary. And just a few practicalities the event is recorded. Uh, the event is run through as you know now the, as a Zoom webinar. And uh, the only participants for whose video is visible are panelists and, uh, and attenders are muted. For questions, please use the chat function. And we will take one or two questions after each presentation. And um, as time will show uh, how many we can take at the end. And now I will give the screen to 
Sally McCollum, the Chief of Network Development Standard Office of uh, Library of Congress, that will present the implementation of BFRAME at Library of Congress. Sally, take the screen. Okay. And, and here it is. Let's go. Sally, to the top. please start. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm going to talk about BFRAME. I, I always abbreviate BibFrame BF, and so if I say BF, you know I mean BibFrame. I'm going to talk about how BibFrame unfolded at the library at the Library of Congress. It has unfolded. The challenges are large at the Library of Congress. We're a large, very uh, big organization. We have our big Washington campus, but we also have a campus for audiovisual down in Virginia, and we have uh, field offices in. Uh, about uh, a half a dozen countries. We have uh, field offices in Nairobi, India, uh, Pakistan, Egypt, um, and uh, in um, Jakarta, and in Rio. Uh, they all do over 300 plus catalogs, and some of them are in those uh, field offices. In fact, they're a very large contingent in India. Uh, we have uh, all form, many forms of material, uh, as many of you do, uh, books, serials, maps, moving image, everything. And as uh, we all know, um, much as, as we would like for them all to look like a book, when we're cataloging, they don't look like a book. When we're cataloging, they have a lot of, of special characteristics. And we also do many languages and scripts. We don't, um, and, and which is uh, another major challenge. Uh, also, Mark, I must say, is deeply embedded in our system, uh, we, our cataloging system, our OPAC, and our and many peripheral systems are Mark-based. Um, so we began with pilots. Pilot one was uh, BibFrame Ontology 1.0, and it was 2015-16. Uh, uh, the um, we had 50 catalogers that we trained. They were to do mark and bib frame descriptions. They could not uh, see doing our mark cataloging, but they were to do that by doing a bib frame uh, record or, or description. Uh, we had very fundamental tools that we did have an editor. We had fairly decent input functionality, and we had a database where you could save the, the data, retrieval uh, capabilities. Um, the, However, at the end of that first pilot, catalogers said, one, they needed better alignment with RDA. This was about the time that the uh, first version of RDA was coming out by it, in their bib frame cataloging. Uh, they needed more control term lists because uh, RDA also is a, a, a large proponent of, of control term lists. And we really wanted to have those lists uh, in the system so that we would have more consistent data. Uh, and they and we they th said they could not sustain doing it five days a week. They could it, even though they were just doing they were doing uh, cataloging both Mark and and Bibray, they were doing it five days a week at that time. So we went to pilot two in 2018. Uh, by then, we had BibFrame 2.0, which was more aligned with RDA. Uh, and we had many more term lists uh, available to the catalogers. We said, why don't you just do a BibFrame two days a week? And that, that would narrow, bring it down to a reasonable amount for, for them. Uh, but we had, um, we retrained the 50 catalogers we had uh, in the first pilot uh, to, the, to BibFrame 2.0. And then we trained another 50. So we had 100 catalogers trained to be able to participate. Um, we input, however, to BibFrame and to Mark still. Uh, we had, they had to do duplicate cataloging. But we also, we needed more flex, we realized we needed more flexibility from that first pilot. So we adjusted the system and we used a local, na used a local namespace for experimentation, what we call BFLC. Okay, so then we were uh, beginning to think after we 
you've been in the, the pilot too for a couple of years, what was it? What were the next steps? And the next steps obviously were all the catalogers and cease double keying. And so we, we wanted to get to that, that point. Um, and so for the last two years of the pilot, we have actually been trying to prepare the system for what we call bib frame 100. And that means 100%. We expect to uh, move between, uh, it, however, we still expect to move between Mark and bib frame for several years. And so we, we realize that that's not something, it's not a switch we're going to turn and all of a sudden the catalogers will just do bib frame. They're going to also need to know Mark at the same time. So the challenges for moving to bib frame 100 were uh, we needed a much more robust and streamlined system. Uh, we were going from 100 catalogers in which well, 100, about 75 of which were really, really active participants, from around 75 to three to over 300 catalogers. And they sat in uh, uh, Cairo, in Delhi, uh, in uh, Islamabad, and in various other places. Um, <clears throat> we moved the system to the cloud so we would have more, even more flexibility because we found as we are, are developing uh, a, a very new um, type of system that we <coughs> constantly needed flexibility in what we were doing. We installed the latest version of our platform, which is MarkLogic that we use. We integrated the cataloging da database with the public version. Uh, our, uh, because we had um, developed the system piecemeal, uh, we had a public version and a, uh, a cataloger version, and the two talked to each other because the cataloger, cataloger system uh, used the uh, uh, lists, the uh, drop-down lists and things of that that we, that we maintained on the public version, but we needed to streamline those and get them and integrate those and get them closer together. We also knew we simply needed a new editor, that the old editor had uh, uh, served its purpose and was uh, no longer, uh, it, it had, it really lacked flexibility. And so we, we had a contractor develop a new interface and we developed a new editor. And meanwhile, we've been revising and revising and revising our uh, conversions, mark to bib frame and bib frame to mark. Because as I say, and I know, Many people, we in particular, would like to just uh, skip it and, and leave Mark behind. We know we can't, uh, that we have many cooperative programs that will depend on Mark. We, we, we have many subsystems that we're not going to be uh, revising uh, just yet. And we can make them work with the bib frame system, but we can't rewrite them right now. And so our goal is in the bib frame 100, by the end of um, 2021 or which is getting uh, alarmingly close or in early 2022. So thank you. And uh, the key website is the uh, loc.gov bib frame website. Thank you. And back over to life or who is next? Who stops sharing? Oh, Philip, are you ready? Uh, Philip Shire is from Stanford University Green Library, and uh, he will present both the project L4P and uh, have some remarks about the data exchange uh, frame to big frame. Take over the screen, Philip. Uh, thanks so much, Live. But first, uh, Sally needs to stop sharing so I can share mine. Oh, you can. Okay, I'm not fine. Where is stop right. sharing? In the top. Good, thank you. Philip, go on. Great, thank you very much. Let me share my presentation and get started.
So again, thank you so much, Life. Uh, my part of the presentation today is to talk about bid frame data flow and interchange in the context of LD4P. But first, I thought I should explain exactly what LD4P is. Link data for production, or LD4P, represents a series of grants funded by the Mellon Foundation to transform traditional technical services cataloging workflows that were rooted in MARC to linked open data. Over the years, we have had many partners and goals, but the objective has always been the same, the transformation of our environment to make use of linked open data. And over the years, BibFrame has emerged as a primary ontology for capturing library data. Although LD4P is focused more broadly on linked open data, many aspects of our project have been optimized for BibFrame as we have evolved together. Our first grant explored critical areas such as tooling and workflows, but already at that time, we identified key areas with deep implications for data interchange. And this is our, are a couple of quotes from our first grant. The cloud space we work in as a community will be the heart of what we do. To get it straight from the beginning will be essential because as the effort expands to all libraries, this space will need to expand to accommodate them. It will also define how we work together as a community in a new linked open data environment. And second, we identified the need for the development of a communication infrastructure to connect this cloud environment to our local environments. This issue of the community coming together to work in common environments and to share the data they create was identified as the most difficult issue to overcome and it still is. The second phase of LD4P, Pathway to Implementation, focused on expanding the cohort of libraries interested in making the transition to linked data and identifying critical impediments in moving from experimentation to implementation. Our current phase of LD4P, Closing the Loop, focuses on the flow of data in the information lifecycle how it can move smoothly and efficiently from editors to data stores to local systems. One of our most critical developments was the creation of an environment that allowed catalogers to catalog directly as linked data. And it was essential to us that this tool would be available via the cloud, as many libraries don't have the technical staff to set up the environment locally. That editor is now ready for use and is accessible to anybody worldwide for experimentation at Sinopia.io. We made the conscious decision to make sure that Sinopia was as broadly useful as possible, and so the developers made sure that it was not dependent on any particular ontology in order to function. However, as I mentioned earlier, we also realized that libraries were committed to BibFrame, and so BibFrame compatibility is still the focus of many of its features. By August of 2020, Sinopia had over 400 users from over 120 organizations worldwide and nearly 3,000 linked data descriptions of library resources. Registrations are still growing and there is a developing global community using Sinopia as its open linked data editor. Questioning Authority is our open source tool designed for searching and bringing in entities into the Sinopia environment. The development here is being done by teams at Cornell and the School of Library and Information Science at the University of Iowa. Data from various open sources are standardized and cached so that the cataloger can query, explore, and import data into Sinopia in a standardized way. In our current grant, we are focusing on the flow of data in the information lifecycle how it can move smoothly and efficiently from editors to data stores to local systems. But what does that mean specifically? The diagram here tries to capture the typical flow of data for a cataloger who is part of the Program for Cooperative Cataloging or PCC. In this workflow, the cataloger, that fuchsia oval on the left, may either create traditional MARC data or link data. If they create MARC data as part of the PCC program, that top flow, their data is sent to OCLC, 
who will collect and send all PCC MARC data to one of our partners, the Share Virtual Discovery Environment, or Share VDE, who will convert the PCC MARC data to BibFrame and collect it in the PCC cache, now called the PCC tenant in their new tenant architecture. If the cataloger belongs to a library who is a Share VDE member, perhaps one of the cohort libraries, that library may send its full collection of MARC data to share VDE for conversion to BibFrame. Now, if the cataloger wishes to catalog directly in BibFrame through Synopia, that lower workflow, that data will flow as BibFrame from the Synopia data store to share VDE as well. Now, to make matters more complex, there are two essential parts of the workflow not identified here. The first is the flow of BibFrame data created in Synopia to OCLC to share with the rest of the world. The second is an optional flow. If the library makes use of an ILS that can only work with MARC, the bib frame data created in Synopia must be converted to MARC and then ingested into that local ILS. As we try to resolve these complex issues of data flow, good partners are essential, some of whom you have heard from and will hear from today. The first are our current LD4P partners doing much of the development work. And for this grant, those partners are Stanford, Cornell, and the School of Library and Information Science at the University of Iowa. The next is the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, an international organization embedded in all aspects of metadata creation and sharing. The next is ShareVDE, a library-driven initiative which brings together the bibliographic catalogs and authority files of a community of libraries in a shared discovery environment based on linked data. Next is the Library of Congress, a thought leader in our transformation to linked data and the developer of BibFrame. And last is OCLC, a key partner in data sharing. Although I hate to finish my presentation with questions rather than answers, I think it is the questions really that will guide our pathway forward. So one of our first questions is, should there be a standard form of BibFrame? for data creation and especially for data exchange. And next, should we even be exchanging data? What data should we exchange and what data should we simply link to? And as the worlds of MARC and BibFrame will exist for decades to come, should data recorded as BibFrame and MARC be kept in sync with each other? And last, and although this question is valid for library data in any format, should library data captured as bib frame be free and open? Now, there are many simultaneous conversations going on at present on the exchange of linked data, and more specifically, the exchange of bib frame data. And certainly, data interoperability will be the key to that conversation. And with that, thank you very much. And back over to you, Light. Thank you, Philip. And I see there is also now no, no specific question for you. So we too take questions and answers also about some of your questions, Philip, uh, at the end. So I, I will go on and invite Friedrich Klingwald from National Library of Sweden to take over the screen and start. Friedrich, you. the screen is yours. There we go. Uh, my name is Freddy Klingwall and I'm a developer at the National Library of Sweden, uh, focused on RDF modeling and data conversion and curation. I also work in the part-time in our KB lab, which is a place where we explore data-driven research and uh, ways to make our collections useful through AI and machine learning. But today's focus will be on our metadata infrastructure called Libris. And Libris in brief is the centralized Swedish Union catalog. Uh, it's a system developed and maintained by the National Library of Sweden, where the data is collaboratively edited by the more than 500 participating libraries in the Libris cooperation. Uh, and uh, the point of this is to share records. They are create, bibliographic records are created once and then the other libraries only need to register a holding which then can be exported to local library systems, uh, since Libris is not a, um, a system for circulation. Uh, 
And Libris also includes the national bibliography and authority file. And in June of 2018, uh, Libris Excel went into production, replacing our old uh, Mark 21 system with one based on uh, linked data uh, that we developed in house. And this was building upon Bibframe. Uh, this includes a core system with a Postgres database and elastic search index, pipelines and APIs for data import and export, conversion between Mark 21 to RDF, uh, specifically JSON LD, and back to Mark 21 for the exports to our libraries, which are still heavily uh, dependent upon the Mark. Uh, we have a virtuoso sparkle. Uh, this is actually available at libris.kb.se slash sparkle. I should have included a link here, but I forgot. And also a cataloging interface based on view. We also have uh, our own linked data service, which includes our vocabulary definitions, which includes the RDFS and our mappings to BigFrame. Uh, and other RDF vocabularies that we use, uh, which includes Dublin Core, Scheme.org, SCOS, and MADS, for example. It also includes uh, our linked entities for countries, languages, and relators, um, subject headings, genre form, and other cataloging lists derived from MARC and RDA, which uh, often link back to Library of Congress, IDLock.gov, and uh, the reason for having our own is because we have a lot of Swedish labels and uh, descriptions that we need to uh, take care of, um, but we always try to link back to the source. We also have a KBV, which is our application vocabulary, and, and it's a bit like BFLC, which Sally mentioned. Uh, we introduced this because of the flexibility it uh, provides. Uh, but in actuality, it's an umbrella of equivalences and subterms. So we use our equivalent classes and properties to say that this term is equal to BibFrame uh, and the other applications would we use. And the, our goal here is to use our RDF vocabulary mappings to enable a richer IO system because um, just uh, deploying our system is only half the battle. We are still heavily dependent on Mark in imports and export, as I told you earlier. And this can also provide with something that we are experimenting with, which we call vocabulary mapping, where we could, uh, from a bib frame uh, description, we could uh, uh, provide a schema org or Dublin core uh, description without conversion, just having the um, the actual classes and properties mapped. Uh, the other thing that we are, which is an ongoing um, challenge, I would say, uh, or, or work that we do daily, it's linking the things in our system. Uh, and it, that is kind of two um, ways to look at it. There are linking relations to entities within the system, which we control and try to uh, figure out um, which strings are actually linkable. Um, and then there are linking to things outside of Libris Excel, which can be Wikidata, Library of Congress, or anywhere else, which provides uh, URIs as identifiers. Uh, and here is uh, another question, which uh, I think Philip was um, kind of touching a bit. Um, what, what does linking mean? Uh, do we do it as a means of further exploration? Or do we link because we need local data to aggregate or cache in our own systems? Uh, if we want to index it for search or such things. Uh, and we also have a way of present these entities uh, with recognizable properties, uh, which we call chips and cards, uh, which is a pattern uh, that can take uh, a title and the label uh, to have like the shortest common denominator for something to be identified um, or a card which is something more uh, can be several properties uh, in combination uh, and just to show you how that could look uh, the, the media type and carrier types uh, are in our cataloging system uh, 
these are the chips and the, the one above uh, which is some kind of which is looking like a summary is uh, the card as it is expressed in the cataloging interface and we are also right now working on uh, um, how to extract work entities in Libris Excel in uh, Mark 21. Um, the distributed record uh, was um, containing all of the Ferber uh, abstractions, if you say, uh, except for items. So the manifestation work expression things were all um, in the Mark record. Uh, and when we uh, did the initial uh, conver conversion from Mark to our big frame data. We kept these entities as uh, local nodes in our instances. Uh, and now we are looking at a clustering algorithm to analyze the possibility of extracting and linking these work entities. Uh, because we could have maybe 20 instances, which is describing the a particular edition or format and, and they will have a shared work so if we could extract that and uh, find out which instances are actually sharing the same work uh, we would reduce duplication data and enabling reuse and linking to this in the further on but this requires a lot of normalizing properties and work entities uh, linking things that might have gone wrong language codes subject genre form and classifications and contributions and so on uh, which brings me to some of the particular challenges which we have uh, um, we are kind of struggling with daily and um, one is the conversion back to mark 21 uh, this is really working with two paradigms at the same time as tom baker said in the introduction with the metadata 2.0 and 3.0 uh, trying to uh, live at the same time uh, this creates a lot of particular problems uh, trying to go forward uh, and in particular one of the things is just to link the ambiguous strings and logical parts to entities which derives from mark 21 which has a legacy of 40 years changing cataloging rules and practices to make the data quite inconsistent so a lot of analysis and normalization has to be done Another question is the different worldviews in linked data, and this is not only um, the, uh, the linked data vocabularies, but it can also be uh, the RDA, big frame, uh, kind of how to look at a work. Um, and finally, what Philip also was talking about, the data exchange, uh, the questions that has been brought up. Um, but in, this is kind of a new uh, way of thinking uh, in Mark 21. It was all based on copying data, uh, and that was the data exchange. Now we are having more possibilities to keep data in sync if we want to, but also that comes with a cost probably, but um, it needs to be explored, and this particularly it has to be explored within the community. So, I want to thank you for this presentation, uh, the ability. We have uh, all our codes repos at, is open at GitHub. So if anyone is interested to follow the development, it is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Friedrich. And uh, we go on uh, to uh, Titiana from Casalina Libri and at Cult. And uh, the screen is yours, Titiana. Okay, do you see my screen? Okay, so thank you for inviting me as a ShareVD representative. And uh, I want to try to stay focused on uh, interoper interoperability in practice, uh, meaning interoperability as a challenge. Uh, linked data means interconnection by nature. And so with this idea in mind, the shared initiative was born to connect bibliographic catalogs across the library community to build a new network of resources published as linked data on shared VD. 
um, shall we do is a collaborative uh, initiative based on needs of a library and developed and supported by uh, a, a rich list of uh, actors that uh, you can see here and many of uh, these are on this uh, table and uh, the diffusion uh, diffusion in the worldwide community is uh, a challenge for ShareVD. So starting from uh, ShareVD members that are uh, university and national libraries in the US, Canada, and Europe, go ahead with the connection within the library community. So Library Congress, Big Frame Adopters, EFLI, D4P, OCLC, Folio and uh, continuing with the connection extend across sister projects uh, so the share family what we call the share family and finish with the connection with uh, the wider web community so this means uh, wikidata schema.org triple yes and so on Uh, one of the most interesting results of ShareVD is exactly this ability of uh, creating a wider community where uh, we can collaborate with external parties that apply linked data to the library domain. The collaboration with external parties in the linked data community allows us uh, to interact with the different domain of uh, LAM and the cultural heritage fields. Uh, and get more input to enhance the shared family and connect many different data sources. This means that the different characteristics of each fields, music, art, and so on, are a useful asset that can be used to advantage not only of the shared family as a whole, but for each single context. While extending the cycles of linked data experiences, different initiatives in the World Wide Web can offer tools and expertise to the wider community, not necessarily specialized. Data and services are interconnected with each other. For example, we will integrate a shared entity data with the Wikidata and vice versa. I will show you something after. And the circular economy and data exchange among uh, different players. Uh, this is just an example of this kind of, co of, of cooperation. Uh, interoperability means uh, the opportunity to dialogue with other communities. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, an example of a result achieved by the ShareVD working group named the Sapienza Entity Identification Working Group, the CEI. The ability to handle different ontology and vocabularies, uh, combining the Bib frame oriented approach with the IFLA ILRM oriented approach. This has been done in order to foster interoper interoperability among the community of shared VD libraries that comprises different entity modeling practices and between other projects that apply pure BibleFrame model. This represents an attempt to harmonize different bibliographical traditions. And the final shared VD's data model becomes a bridge between different worlds and it represents the main trait of shared VD to be compliant with the different visions. Clustering features uh, are important for a collaborative global catalog such as ours. And we will have many very similar work entities and we need the clustering mechanism to bring together all the mostly same work entities. This is ultimately was done by the CEI group. And now we are working on instance. Uh, here is the model outlined for distance entity with uh, relationship to other key classes and associated properties. Of course, uh, instance cluster process is very important for a global and a unique catalog, uh, also the case of ShareVD. And this is just an example of how we are modeling it. But to go ahead with cooperation, in addition to this, uh, while uh, uh, there are differences in RDA, for example, in BibleFrame elements, as demonstrated here, both can be used in a shared data set. The use of one does not preclude another, but rather it becomes a case where the data can be further enriched with both. 
Another kind of uh, uh, interoperability is uh, integration with other projects uh, and uh, APIs architecture, simplify interconnection and the reusability, sustainability and the scalability. API, API means uh, an open window to an open world. And uh, the APIs layer facilitates uh, the interaction with the external linked data project such as Folio, PCC, LD4P project, particularly as Philip said before, with the Synopia cataloging module. The whole portal is composed using a multi API APIs uh, uh, layer architecture. And this means that uh, each singular component for search or for update and so on of the portal can be uh, used to dialogue with other external system and software. And this is just an example of query languages. Um, the editing tool, JCricket, will allow so for editing the shared VD cluster knowledge base sapientia and uh, to extend authority capability through the integration with external data sources such as Wikidata and Disney, Library of Congress, and so on. JCricket becomes a key tool to assure a general interaction with external application. In the data cycle that Philip has presented before, where the editor app will have a central law, for example, for data quality actions, so very important. The interconnection with Wikidata will allow searching the source and enriching the data, uh, the shared with the data with the Wikidata entities information and of course vice versa. And this is just some example of the Jack Ricket interaction with uh, Wikidata to simplify the work. But another example of cooperation is uh, the integration with schema.org is a result of cooperation with the web technologies. Uh, example of how web technologies such as schema.org, not specific to the library domain, can now be applied to library data and enhance their discoverability and the consumption. What happens when different catalogs, uh, uh, different data sources are connected to through linked data? A book found in a library catalog redirects to a painting in a, an art gallery, to a statue in a museum, and so on. It's not just simple HTML links, it's about the way information is structured behind the scenes of the web itself. And so to complete, to finish, finally, the cooperation and interoperability Operability of a linked open data as paradigm. Here are some examples of the new ShareVD 2.0 portal. It's an entity discovery system more and more oriented to the publication of entities and their respective relationships. It's a concrete example of how enrichment of data from external sources can benefit the end user experience. Beta version of this portal is available from September 20, and you can give a loop. Look, the uh, uh, you, uh, URL is uh, published, is uh, reported here. And so, to conclude, the portal is going through a full revision of the technological architecture with the addition of many functions, most of all for the end user. For example, the ability to view the same entity in different language of alphabets. So please test what you like, if you like it, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Titiana. And uh, we now go to the last presentation of uh, Miklas Lindvoj from the National Library of uh, Hungary, and the, it is recorded. So, Sonny, will you start it? Dear colleagues, thank you so much for your interest. Today, I would like to give you a quick overview about the Hungarian National Library platform and how this platform is dealing with data, what is the internal data model, and how do we exchange data with external applications. The Hungarian National Library platform is a very comprehensive platform for cooperation, collecting data, cataloging data, sharing data, give overall services to the library domain, and with the ambition to reach beyond the libraries and work together with any other collections in museums, and archives. On this picture you see in red 
the traditional library functions. We try to indicate that it's not only one library, but many libraries and many types of libraries. The blue part is the end user. This is the focus of our work, where we would like to serve the end user to be able to reach the traditional collections and also all kinds of digital services. The middle part, the green one, is the most interesting and the emphasis is on this, which is not domain specific. We would like to have a space where anyone can catalog, uh, exchange, make interlibrary loans and create namespaces, ontologies and define workflows which are not only within the library sector. The whole platform is running on an infrastructure which is centrally served with storage services and technical services. Today, uh, the most important source of information is the Internet. And if you look at structured and trustworthy data, the Wiki universe is one of the most interesting and important uh, domains. With editorial workflows, it makes possible that all kinds of participants can create the knowledge which is available there, and the whole is publicly available for anyone. So it's a prime example for us how we can work together, uh, classify data, make it trustworthy, and interlink with each other in many languages, many domains, and different sources. Considering all this, uh, as we try to set the main pillars of our approach and development, first of all, we defined that the data model which we are using should be entity-based and very flexible, adjustable and sustainable. We really wanted to have a real multi-tenant system with many participants, not only organizations, but civilians or anyone, researcher, uh, any kind of contributor who has the best knowledge in a certain domain. We wanted to have flexible workflows, which are parameter and context driven, that we can connect all types of people, all types of applications and all types of data with very flexible approaches. And of course, the modularity technically based on microservices is a must so that we can build uh, IT systems which are capable of communicating with each other. The data model is the key in our platform to make sure that the platform is flexible and open. We have set up an extensive and comprehensive list of requirements regarding data. We allow any source of information, organizations and civilians and researchers and scientists, and multiple data exchange formats we can handle. Very important that we set up workflows where an editorial team can classify data. The quality level shows us how reliable and complete certain data is, and the trustworthiness shows how reliable the source is. So we can make a complex array of information where we always know where it comes from and how trustworthy in the system that information is. Through this, we allow variations of data and also competing data. And of course, it can turn out that some information, which we thought it's valid, uh, we know after a time that it's not really valid. So we have to cater off the validity of data for a certain period of time. How is the platform doing all this? How you can be independent of any data exchange format internally? So we use a traditional knowledge graph as we all know it. There are certain disadvantages of this traditional model, which means uh, if you want to make a statement about the statement, then you add another statement and this tree can be branched into infinity. And the false statement, you have to follow quite a long way to figure out that something is wrong. 
and what we definitely need in our system to deal with competing statements. So we have to do, introduce something new. The traditional graph model consists of subject, object, and predicate. In order to enhance it and fulfill our expectations, we introduced two new things, selector and life cycle. And doing this, we call the whole structure a quintuplet. The selector gives us the possibility to position the statement alongside the dimensions of the document. And the life cycle gives us the freedom to give all the source information we need about creation, the validity, and the certainty. This slide shows how we can connect to the IIIF standard in displaying and visualizing our information. The more accurate you specify the location of a statement, the more accurately you can link pieces of information of data. And you can extend this whole thing by defining the appropriate coordinate system, and you can extend it to different domains, not only visualization. If you connect on the platform many sources of information, you will always have competing data and conflicting statements. So you need a structure where you can easily select statements which are currently treated as valid. You need to preserve the history of statements in order to know what was meant before and to see how your data evolves over time. Entity management, local, international and national namespaces are the focus of the data model we are using. I don't have the time now to go into much detail, but I just wanted to show you that these uh, graph connections are catering for connections with all type of ontologies and namespaces. For the record types, you can define a customizable set of values. The records, what we know today as authority records, can have a simplified graph representation. And you can manage this historically as well. And you can support this process with automatically derived name variants based on statements. The entities are interlinked and you have to cater for indexing those items and it happens automatically and synchronized. All the changes in the entities are constantly done. The applied graph model is capable of taking care of all these identification and linking of data. So it would fulfill the requirements of RDA the big frame model, the mark model, the Dublin core, semantic web requirements, and all sorts of cataloging principles. So it's adjustable and flexible and sustainable. The underlying uh, logical principle is the object schema, uh, applying property types and object types. Uh, and this makes possible that you can connect all types of metadata exchange formats to this model. I'm completely aware that the time was very short and I couldn't give you as much information as I really intended to, but I hope that I raised your interest and you will have the time and curiosity to study those web pages about the Hungarian National Library Platform and the Folio. Both projects are very courageous and taking brand new approaches, taking risks, and we are looking to partners who are willing to test those approaches. I'm hoping to see you in the future. If you have any questions, please consult those pages or ask us a question. Thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you, Miklas, for your presentation. And I know that people need to, to go on for, for next meetings. So I will say uh, thank you.
And I can see in the chat, if you look at that, that uh, the executive director of DCMI uh, are very happy with, with our uh, with our presentations and or, or already now asked to have a panel about this next year on DCMI uh, uh, 2022. So I think we should do that. Thank you to all of you. And thank you. Have a, have a nice evening. Have a nice day. Have a nice morning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye.